few students are not muting sarath and manish agarwal i think you have to mute yourself and all those others who are having their uh, mode non mute you know they should mute because it is causing lot of disturbance Okay, the types of uh, I'll start. I'll just finish off. So this is one yeah, of the yeah. most. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, no problem. The types of sequestrum are tubular, which is seen in long bones. Annular, it is seen in amputation stump. A ring is seen around the pin tracts. Flake, coke, and rice grain uh, sequestrum are uh, characteristic of tuberculosis. A button sequestrum is seen in histiocytosis. A feathery sequestrum, very rare in syphilis. A matrix uh, sequestrum is seen in sickle cell disease. A colored sequestrum in fungal. the black is seen in gunshot and bombay is seen in the exposed bone after open fracture uh i'll stop here so we'll uh, continue the remaining slides in next uh, this thing the only sure, tubercular sure. discite is in actinomycosis two more slides sir. yeah i'll stop uh, screen share also sir okay can you see my screen yes sir yeah so good evening uh, friends and all the faculty members um i think uh, first of all as the exam is approaching wish you all the best uh, for your dnb exams and uh, i had taken this class uh, some time back um, so for your revision i am repeating this class on instruments um, if you have any questions don't hesitate to ask it i will try to go fast because there are uh, too many slides and i will explain on those slides which are likely to be you know more important for the exams the proper knowledge about uh, the instruments and implants is very essential for successful surgery there are couple of more things which are necessary like sound knowledge of orthopedic principles then good surgical skill and trained assistants well equipped operation theater proper instrumentation proper implants and very important the knowledge regarding the right indications and techniques to use for a specific instrument or implant i'll just go through quickly about some general instruments which can be either asked on the instrument table or maybe on the ward rounds this is a sponge holding forceps as we all know you start your ot preparation of the patient with this for the initial painting then somebody may ask you about the uh, part parker handles you know you must know what are the commonly used numbers and what are the commonly used numbers of blades which are used on these handles like for the skin incision you use uh, number 4 handle and the blades used are either 21 22 or 23 number and and the 7 uh, number handle has got either 11 number 15 number or 10 number blades you can use and this is usually used for deeper dissection then these are dialer dialer and then these are the various types of uh, tooth and plane forceps um, i think uh, this is only just to complete the list because i don't think you will be asked on this these are some other unusual uh, tooth forceps this is the one which is used for actually doing stapling of the skin when you are doing closure this has got a peculiar kind of jaw so if somebody keeps it there you must know about it then these are the various retractors which can be kept and can be asked this is a cat's paw which has got two ends on one of the designs is with a hook on one side the other one is with a retractor on the other side then these are the cat's paws which are used with on the one side these are different designs then these are langenbach retractors of different varieties and different sizes these are journeys retractors 
and this is a diverse retractor which is used for mainly the abdominal organs like liver or if you are doing the retroperitoneal some procedure then to retract the uh, abdominal organs you have to use this with a sponge on top of the organs this is a langenbach retractor this is a big size and i have shown different different sizes on that this is some people may ask you know if uh, you are aware about the name so this is a sen miller retractor or cat's paw retractor which has got two ends this is zerny's retractor which has got two ends one is flat and the other one is uh, uh, bifid or biprong so that the pressure on the tissues is minimized then these are the skin hooks which can be used in small surgeries where you don't want to hurt the tissues and the tissues are delicate and small like in hand surgery wherein you can use these uh, skin hooks this is the last one is a double prong skin hook then elis tissue holding forceps if it is asked in the exam then may ask you what is the difference between this and uh, uh, cockers and this is a non traumatizing kind of an instrument so can be used to hold a tissue like even sometimes a skin this is a cockers forceps which has got very strong grip this is a male female jaw and you can hold any tough tissue with this and you can use it in the joint replacement surgeries or you know surgery where you have to hold some tough tissue and you have to excise it then these are different types of periosteum elevators you know this design this particular design is called as a cobs periosteum elevator you can get it in various sizes these are the two periosteum elevators which are used for minimally invasive surgery and they have a hole at the tip so if you have exposed the tissues on one side and you want to pass a plate for biological fixation by minimally invasive technique then you can just pass this periosteum elevator on the other side underneath the muscles extra periosteally and and then uh, you can take a small incision and tie the plate on the other side and pull it through this hole or you can just make a tunnel through this these are some small ones which are used for hand surgery or metacarpals metatarsals in the foot and ankle surgery this is the farabous periosteum elevator so as i said some examiners are fond of asking the names so you must know at least few names these are different kinds of bone levers or spikes as you, you can call them these are the small ones which are used for small bones like metacarpals or small radius ulna then these are little bigger ones which can be used for radius ulna in a little stronger patient or you can use it in humerus and the bigger ones can be used for tibia fibula femur these are the radiolucent spikes which sometimes can be useful when you want to do imaging in presence of the spikes so these are the radiolucent spikes which can be used and if the patient is very strong or you are doing revision surgery when the tissues are very fibrotic then you can use these broad uh, bone levers these are some other bone levers which are used for specific purposes like you know this is the one which is used as a posterior spike for total knee replacement then these are the ones which can be used in different to positions in the hip surgery and these are also for anterior retractors of the, uh, the hip on the acetabulum side these are also some of the retractors which are used for the uh, pelvic acetabular surgery this is also called as a homans bone lever and we have seen different different sizes of these homans these are blounds bone levers the one which we use a posterior spike in the total knee replacement surgery this is also known as a blounds bone lever then these are the various types of bone holding forceps these are the ones which can be used for small radius ulnas or for the metacarpals metatarsals and uh, the uh, big Other ones can be used for the adult radius ulna. These can be used. This has got a facility to hold the plate also in this design, so can be used for uh, the radius ulna fixation. The medium size can be used for the humerus. These 
this is also for humerus again this has got a facility for holding the uh, plate in addition to the bone this is also a similar kind of a bone holding forces which has got a facility for holding the plate this is a different design for passing an interfrac screw this is a big bone holding forceps which has got adjustable jaw you can as per the size of the bone you can increase or decrease the size of the and these are the ones for the bigger bones like tibia fibula this is a hegrus bone holding forceps as i said some names you must be aware this is a burns bone holding forceps which is used for radius ulna this is a plate cum bone holding forceps which can be used for humerus then this is a instrument which was very commonly used in the past nowadays not many people use it this is called as a lomans clamp and this was used to hold the plate on top of the bone you know these curved jaws they go on the other side of the bone the plate sits here and you can clamp the plate to the bone when you are doing the fixation so it can do job of both holding the bone as well as the plate and you can do the fixation quite easily these are different types of drill bits you know you must know the sizes and two designs this is a simple drill bit and this is a quick coupling drill bit which can be used on a quick coupling attachment on a drill so these are the ones which are with quick coupling attachments and these are the ordinary drill bits and the commonly required sizes are 2.5 3.2 3.5 4.5 you know these are the drill bits which are required for those sizes of screws like 3.5 4.5 and 4 mm screws and 6.5 mm screws you require all these sizes of drill bits you know. then you must know what is a drill guide this is a drill guide which guides you a drill into the hole of a dcp so this is a central drill guide and this is an eccentric drill guide and this is different from the next one that is a drill sleeve this is a drill sleeve and this is a tap sleeve so you drill through this and the tap is of a little bigger diameter so this is used for tap so if you get somebody who is very fond of asking all the steps of a trauma surgery as per the ao protocols you know very you know you want to use a drill you have to use either a drill guide or drill sleeve depending on the situation whether you are going through the plate or directly the role of this is basically to protect the soft tissues when you are drilling so that the soft tissues don't get entangled and the sizes of these two are different this is little bigger because the tap has to go through this these are different types of taps you know these are for 3.5 mm this is a cannulated or 4 mm this is for the 4 mm cannulated screws then these are the counter sinks i'll show you a enlarged picture of that then these are the taps this is again on a quick coupling design this is a quick coupling design and you must know the design of the tap threads whether it is a 14 tpi that is 14 threads per inch like this one or this one this is a 14 tpi tap and this is a 20 tpi tap that is 20 threads per inch so if you have a screw which is uh, designed as 20 tpi screw then you have to use the tap with a 20 tpi threading and if you are going to use a 14 tpi screw then you have to use that particular tap respectively and this is a detachable handle which can be used on any one of these uh, quick coupling taps this is a counter sink and you must know where you will use it this is for 3.5 mm screw and this is for 4.5 mm screw or 6.5 mm screw basically when you are going to put a plate on top of interfragmentary screw and the screw head is likely to cause problem for the sitting of a plate on the bone surface you have to countersink the head of the screw so you have to use this particular instrument by which on the cortex you make a little bigger hole and then the head of the screw can be countersunk so that it doesn't come in way of your plate which is going to sit on top then these are depth gauges 
and uh, this is for 3.5 and 4.5 or 6.5 millimeter uh, screws then these are the shan pins and esculap clamps again shan pins are available right from the metacarpals or phalanges to the tibia femur in different sizes starting from 2.5 mm and you can go up to uh, 4.5 or 5 mm shan pins these are the tapering shan pins which has got a long this thing which is used for mainly either elizaro or lrs system and these are the other ones which are normally used for all esculap clamps and this is a self drilling uh, shan pin when you want to do a very quick job you don't want to spend time in first drilling then you find out the hole and then put a shan pin so you can put it on a drill go very slow you must have a good control on your drill and you can drill with this and then you slow down the speed so that with the same drill you can actually pass into the opposite cortex and you can get hold of these threads into the proximal cortex these these are the clamps this is a pin to rod clamp one small hole one big hole and these are rod to rod clamps where there are both the holes are big size then these are the rods for the radius and the fixators and this is a distractor rod you know you can put these clamps on this and this is a device by which you can distract so in case you want to distract you know this kind of a distraction rod you can use you can even compress the fracture site if you want with the same device <laughs> these are some different kinds of external fixators this is a lrs system this is called as a crocodile uh, design to external fixator clamp and you can put two of these on either side so that you can do distraction of the fracture site and the advantage of these multiple holes is that you can vary the placement of your pins in you know, and you can still easily adjust it and by this central rotating part you can distract or compress this is also a similar thing but not having too many holes this is a a uh, small clamp for the fingers or metacarpals or metatarsals and uh, these are the johari design of uh, uh, fixators this also has a facility for bone transport this can be used for radius ulna you know bone loss or bone lengthening and this is a fixator which has got a hinge over here which can be used for lower end of radius wherein you can put a fixator distractor and you can later on do early mobilization this is a, a chanlis compression clamp which was very commonly used for the compression orthodesis of the knee now the orthodesis surgery itself has become comparatively rare but this is some uh, something which you must know about and you have to put pins through these holes one in the tibia and one in the femur or one in the tibia and one in the talus and you can compress it from the side so that uh, the cancellous bone gets compressed on each other and you can achieve fusion very fast and this is a femoral distractor in uh, dif difficult uh, proximal tibia fractures when you want to distract the joint or delayed Uh, surgeries wherein there is overriding and you want to correct the overriding you can pass a shan pin from here and here and then you can use this to distract so that you can achieve the reduction and then you can um, do your next job of surgical fixation this is a uh, you know some components of jess fixator you must know about these clamps these are closed clamps and these are open clamps you know which can be used for jess fixator and these are some of the uh, additional distractors which are used in the jess fixator then th these are the instruments which are used for tension band wiring you know you must know about the stainless steel wire what are the gauges from 18 20 22 you know they depending on the size that you need these are a wire passers and this is a wire tensioner this is a instrument set from ao you know these are the two wire passers of different curvatures 
this is a synthes wire you know which can be used for uh, the circular wiring and these are the other instruments which are used for cutting the wire these are the two wire holding instruments for tightening this is a new design of wire passer wherein by minimally invasive technique you can pass the wire through this after passing the two jaws around the bone and the wire goes through this and it comes out from this side and then you can separate separate the two jaws take it out and you can just tighten the wire so that without exposing too much of soft tissues you can achieve circulage wire so this is a new design these are commentary staples when uh, we were doing routinely close wedge high tibial osteotomies this was one of the commonly used implant commentary staples and this strip used to take care of the strip which was created after doing a osteotomy close wedge osteotomy and this is a uh, instrument which is used for holding these staples and impacting it and you have to hold the staple here and then impact it these are few other varieties of staples this can be used even uh, for repair of the uh, uh, collateral ligaments in the knee injuries and this can be used even before these eight plates were available you know these uh, staples were used for the growth modulation to take care of the uh, excessive growth on one side these are stinman pin this is one of the instrument which will be definitely asked if you go on the ward round you must know the diameter then you must know how to pass a stinman pin whether you will hammer it whether you will uh, put it on a drill which kind of drill is ideal for this what is the location where you will use this especially in the proximal tibia whether you will go from medial to lateral or lateral to medial and you must know all the reasons why you will go from lateral to medial not from medial to lateral the other places where you can use it you can use it on the lower end of the tibia you can use it from the lower end of the femur and you can use it from the calcaneum also so uh, a stinman pin you can get in the ward rounds or on the instrument table and you must be familiar with all the uses of this particular versatile in instrument this is a dunham pin you can very obviously see that the central part is threaded so whenever the bone is very porotic you know this part engages into the proximal cortex so the chances of loosening of this particular thing in a porotic bone uh, is much less than the stinman pin so this can be also asked in the rounds or on the instrument table <coughs> this bowler stir up is basically to put the traction from the stinman or the uh, dunham pin then this is another variety of uh, the shans pin this has got a rounded end and this is used for lateral traction in central fracture dislocation of the hip this can be used on table when you are doing open surgery to uh, reduce the hip and then plate it or if the patient is unfit for surgery to use it for lateral traction for a longer time then also you can use it through the trochanter aimed at the center of the head and you can give a lateral traction through this rounded part then these are the wires k wires you can have uh, standard 6 uh, inch or you can have extra long wires this can be sharp at both the ends or some of the imported wires that you get they are flat at one end only sharp at the other end and you must know in what diameters you have them available right from 0.8 mm to 1 mm 1.2 1.6 1.8 2 2.5 3 3.5 you know different diameters that you must be aware and where you will use them so for example if you want to use it in patella what kind of uh, size you will choose or you want to do it for olecranon or medial malleolus which size you will use if you want to use it in the proximal tibia as a temporary stabilization what size you will use so all these things you must be aware one more additional information about this is in a porotic bone for proximal humerus if you are going to use it as a definitive modality you can use even a threaded k wire 
which takes good hold and doesn't loosen out very easily. This is a Z type of K wire bender, and you can use it for bending the wires. This is the most plier come wire bender, and uh, this is one of the most commonly used instruments. So you must be uh, familiar with the use of this. This is a wire cutter. There are different designs, and this is one of the designs which uh, I have uh, with me, which is very beautifully designed and very sharp. This is a Mollison self-retaining uh, hemostatic retractor. So, if you tell this complete name, you know this particular retractor not only serves the purpose of retraction, but then if you put it after taking the incision, you know because of the pressure, it can stop small small bleeders. That is why it is called as Mollison self-retaining hemostatic retractor. Then these are the different sizes of osteotomes and gouges. The osteotome and uh, gouges, you must know the difference. You must know the difference between the osteotome and a chisel. These are the osteotomes which are used for small bones. This is a curved one. These are straight ones. You can have this is a curved one. This is also a curved one. And this is a gouge. This is a gouge. Where you will use gouge, where you will use the osteotome, and where you will use a chisel. So this is an osteotome which has got both the ends sharp and tapering at the tip and the chisel has only one edge beveled which is used to chip the bone you know, if you are doing saucerization or you want to remove some part of the surface of the bone then you can use even a chisel but if you want to cut the bone or divide the bone then you have to use an osteotome because it has got both sharp edges then if Dr. Jain Sharma is your examiner, then he will ask you this instrument. Um, this is a corticotome which is used for Elizaro surgery. And you have to know about the design of this. This is a blunt tip by the side so that when you are doing a corticotomy, uh, you know, by taking a small incision on the periosteum, you can pass this instrument in such a way that you can go around the cortex without entering into the medulla. That is the ideal way of using this instrument. So you go both sides around the cortex and to prevent the damage to the periosteum, this is the additional tip which is quite blunt. So this is a corticotome which is used in basically corticotomy which is common in Elizaro surgery. Then these are bone gouges of different designs. And you can see that this has got a scoop-shaped uh, you know, the surface wherein you can take out the uh, cancellous bone or you can uh, take out the uh, graft very easily either from iliac crest or from any soft part of uh, the bone like uh, cancellous bone. Then these are different types of punches commonly used for radius ulna. You can have these kind of punches which can be used in spine different designs with little flatter ends you can use in the proximal tibia when you want to elevate the depressed fragments and you can use these punches even for uh, punching in the bone grafts in the non-union situation so the different designs and different shapes of the bone punches which can be used in different indications and different situations this is a reduction clip or reduction forceps which can be used to hold the two uh, bony surfaces without creating too much of pressure and without separating too much of soft tissue attachment on these fragments and then you can do a temporary fixation. These are patella reduction forceps. Two designs. This has got uh, you know the beads on the tips so that, that they don't penetrate inside. These are little sharp, one, sharp ones which can penetrate into the bone. So they are to this uh, ball design at the tip is the one which is useful in porotic bones. This can be used in young bones before passing the tension and this K wires for tension band. These are different kinds of reduction forceps or uh, reduction clamps and you can use it in different bones like uh, radius ulna. This can be used for humerus or uh, sometimes a small tibia and this can be used on big bones like 
to added tibia and femur and, and this also you know can be used without too much of soft soft tissue stripping you can use these instruments and you can maintain the reduction very well when you achieve temporary stabilization either with uh, k wires or by passing an interfragmentary screw this is a reduction clamp for finger injuries the tip of this particular instrument is radio lucent and you can see there is a hollow in between the two jaws so you can hold a spiral fracture of a phalanx with this and you can pass uh, the k wire through this and uh, later on you can release that after you have cut the wire so this allows you imaging in spite of holding the position because of the radio lucent tips of this particular instrument this is a bone hook again a commonly used instrument which can be used in variety of surgeries and you must be aware about at least few of the uses where you can use without uh, doing too much of soft tissue, soft tissue stripping how, how you can lift up the bone fragment to get the reduction even while you are doing close fixations like close interlock nails you know this can be one of the instruments which can be of great help then these are various bone rongers all these small big ones are all double action rongers and the last two ones are the single action rongers you know they don't have the and two joints so they are called a single action these are all, all double action rongers and there are various shapes which can be used in different indications like this one can be used for the spine surgery so that you can put your uh, jaws of this instrument underneath the lamina and you can cut it without obstructing the vision this is a close view of a double action bone ronger these are bone cutters this one is called as a tudor edward uh, spinous process cutting forces which is used for spine surgery and this these two can be used for any bone cutting so they are the bone cutters then these are the different types of curettes you know this is a double ended curette one small one big uh, end this is a very small curette which can be used for small bones this is a rectangular ring curette which is hollow in between and these big curettes are normally used for the total hip surgery wherein you have to scrape the acetabulum or you have to scrape uh, the femoral marrow that time you can use these different sizes of big bone uh, curettes you know this is a close up view of a double ended bone curette then this is a gilly saw you know these are the handles and they are hooks at the end and this is a wire which has got these loops which you can put it inside and you can use it for cutting the bone commonly used for doing amputations and uh, sometimes even some elizaro surgeons are fond of using this gilly saw wire for doing corticotomy instead of uh, the corticotomes then if somebody is uh, fond of asking about the joint replacement instruments they can ask you about this cement gun and you get a cement syringe which can be attached on to this and uh, you can use it for injecting the cement in uh, total hip surgery mainly and, and these are the instruments for removal of the cement when you are trying to remove the cement from the bone marrow these are the long osteotomes and this is a hook like curette which can be used to take out the cement from the bone marrow these are some of the instruments which are used for pelvic acetabular surgery mainly and this is something called as a ball spike though this doesn't look like spike you know this has got a sharp end with a ball at the base so you can hold a piece of a particular bone of pelvis and do the fixation or you can pass a wire or screw uh, without uh, obstructing your vision these are the in situ benders wherein you can use the recon plates can be bent while doing pelvic acetabular surgery these are different designs of pelvic acetabular reduction clamps and this is also another variety of a plate bender 
then this is a broken screw removal set from synthes one of the instrument set which i am i would again insist that every trauma surgeon must have in his uh, armamentarium because nowadays with especially the locking screws and plates coming in getting stuck by not able to remove the screw is a very common situation and i think this particular set of instruments is something which can really save you from lot of tension on the table so this is one set i think one every trauma surgeon should have with him this is an indian set manufactured by one kshirsagar and company for removal of damaged screw heads and uh, i would uh, very strongly say that this is better than even eo set or synthes set for removal of the damaged screws and broken screws you know. excellent set of instruments this is a humbi skin grafting knife handle and this is a blade which can be fitted on this so you know in given situation if you don't have a plastic surgeon and you have to do some uh, split thickness or thyrosis bone graft i mean uh, skin graft you can use this particular uh, skin grafting handle then these are some of the instruments which can be asked to you on the uh, mod rounds this is a ishmat plaster caesar you know and this particular tip though it is looking pointed is very blunt and this can go underneath the plaster and you can use it for cutting the plaster without traumatizing the skin this is a plaster shear which can again be used in a similar way but this can directly cut the plaster and this is a henings plaster cast spreader once you have cut the plaster with this instrument you can spread the plaster cast so that the plaster can be removed more easily but these are the, this instrument cannot be used with the new synthetic uh, cast because it is very difficult to spread those plasters with this this is a manual plaster cutter and this is a electrical plaster cutter and for the uh, synthetic plaster you need a different uh, you know blade for this which has uh, got more hardened material to cut the synthetic plasters then some museum instruments this is a thronton plate which was used for sp pins this, this is a maclaughlin plate and these are the uh, angle blade plates different designs which were used this is a sp nail with a thronton plate which was used for fixing the uh, intertrochanteric fractures this is a picture taken from a book because i have used them before but now i couldn't uh, get any pictures of that this is uh, sp nail or smith peterson nail and a plate this was an assembly and this was a trifline starter if you see the shape of this nail and this starter you know you have to make a track for the nail with this starter which goes on the guide wire and then you can pass that so it was similarly used for the jewet nail the same starter and you, you can use this which is a single assembly of blade and plate with a fixed angle on that this is a kessler's plate and this is a wainwright plate both these plates were used for fixing the macmurray's osteotomy or medial displacement osteotomy which was one of the commonly done procedures in the past so if somebody asks you about macmurray's osteotomy after seeing this kind of instrument then you must know at least some basic uh, reasons of doing a macmurray's osteotomy there was another variety of plate called as a tupman plate which i had in my stock but i couldn't locate it again used for fixing the macmurray's osteotomy this was how the wainwright plate was uh, used then these are again uh, you know museum instruments called as moor spins and novel spins you know these were used for fixing the pediatric fracture neck femurs and these two nuts one was for uh, locking it onto the bone and this was for locking this nut and then this part of the uh, moor spin was cut so somebody may ask you about these historical instruments if you are uh, in a big teaching institute which is having this old stock of instruments then this is regarding some instruments which are used in spine 
this is a crushfield tong and this is a garden well skull traction tong and you must know the indications for using this uh, tongs where you will use it in cervical spine then you must know at what level of injury how much kilo of weight you will use because this can be asked in if there is any patient on this kind of attraction in the ward rounds then you can be asked all the details about how much weight you will put how will you put the tongs on the head what will be the location of these pins which are there so you must be aware about all the details of these instruments then these are other few instruments which are used for spine surgery this is a kerison ronger they are forwards backwards and angled ones uh, how you decide about forward or backward when you are holding this if the joy is facing forward then it is called as a forward ronger and if it is facing on the back side then it is called as a backward ronger and these are the pituitary forceps or disc holding forceps and these are the ring curates which are used for the removal of a disc these are the dura retractors of different sizes and shapes this is a close up view of a forward angled kerison ronger and depending on the breadth of the jaw you get it in 2 3 4 uh, number you know that all is decided by how much bite you can take so the numbers come from that these are all dura separators or dura retractors these are the ring curates which can be used for taking out the loose disc material from the disc space once you have taken incision on that these are disc punches then again you know this is a straight disc punch this is a forward disc punch so you can put this instrument and you can remove the disc loose material from the other side uh, rather than opening on the posterior longitudinal ligament on the other side again and this is a backward so like rongers you know these disc punches also are having forward and backward names this is a hard shield rectangle some spine surgeons are still fond of using this with sublaminar wires for stabilization of spine including cervical spine and uh, they have to be fixed with sublaminar wires this is again an historical instrument harrington rod this was a kind of uh, system that was used for distraction of the spine for correction of scoliosis we have used it in the past for even treating traumatic spines wherein we could do stabilization and even correction of a displacement including complete spondylolisthesis which was corrected by this distraction uh, of harrington instrumentation and this was the hook on which one side was arranged and this was the side which could be distracted this was a harrington rod distractor you know you could put it through the hooks and you can distract it and get the correction this was after the harrington and uh, the hard shield this was the pedicular screw system which came and this was uh, popularized by arthur stephy and uh, this was a stephy plate and these are stephy screws and these are the holes which are having multiple options of putting the screw and you can put it through this screws should be put through the pedicles and you can put one plate on either side and tighten the plate with this particular screw and lock it with this and then you cut it off that was the uh, stephy plate we have used it in fracture stabilizations we have used it even in the correction of lysthesis in the past but from the time the mos miami system came i think all these uh, instruments are very rarely used this mos miami system has got these pedicular screws which come in two different types mono and polyaxial and uh, these These are the rods to fix these particular screws. This can be used as a connecting assembly to uh, connect these two rods. So this is an example of how you pass the particular screws in Moss Miami and how you connect the two rods on top. 
these are the different screws which are available different rods which are available and few other instruments which are required for the mos miami fixation these are the instruments for holding the uh, mono and polyaxial screws and some of the instruments which are there to press the rod in position and, and then tighten the top nuts on that these are again few instruments for holding and distraction and compression of the mos miami screws these are spinal fusion cages which can be used now you can get it in titanium you can get in peak material like anchors so that uh, you can get the uh, fusion of uh, the uh, vertebrae by putting a cage in the intervertebral space then let's go to the plates and screws i think this can be one of the commonest uh, implant that can be asked in the examination and what are the parts of the screws you must know that there is a head there is a shaft there are threads there is a tip which is either having a flute or uh, it can be called as a self tapping and without flute is a non self tapping then you must know about uh, the core diameter the core diameter is the one which is the inner diameter like this and this is a thread diameter or the outer diameter which is the outer part of this you must know what is a pitch pitch is the distance between the two threads so once you rotate the screw head once you know that much is the distance which the screw is going to advance so that is a pitch then there are two designs one is a reverse cutting threads and non reverse cutting threads so uh, you must know about all that and if there is a non self tapping screw then you have to tap it before you pass the screw inside otherwise the screw will get stuck inside so the important parts of the screw and the additional points about the screw where you will use uh, which type of screw that all you must be aware these are the different types of head types of heads slots on the screws when we started practice we used to have the single slot screws then came the crochet uh, slots and then came the phillips uh, head screw uh, slots then came the hexagonal which are the ones which are most common right now but now there are number of them who are coming with uh, the star shaped uh, slots and you need different screw drivers for these so when you are using these different sizes i mean uh, the designs of these uh, heads on the discharge card you must make it a point to mention that you have used a star uh, head uh, screw in this particular implant so that if the patient lands up for removal the surgeon is not faced with lot of difficulties so this is a enlarged picture of uh, the core diameter and the outer diameter and effective depth of this screw head then as i was telling non self tapping and self tapping screws this is a non self tapping and this is a self tapping because this has got a flute this particular groove so when you are advancing the screw the bone dust which is created is actually given a way to come out so that the screw can advance without causing too much of friction and pressure these are the cancellous screws 6.5 mm they are available as cannulated and non cannulated and they have different thread lengths on this this is a 16 mm thread more useful in the intracapsular fracture neck femurs this is a 30 uh, 2 mm threading and this is a full threaded screw so these are the three different designs of 6.5 mm screw this is a cancellous screw which is cannulated so you can use it cannulated or non cannulated then this is a malleolar screw the design and difference is that in a malleolar screw the tip has got no threads so whenever you want to have a good hold into the opposite cortex you have to use a little longer screw 
because this part doesn't take hold in cortex opposite cortex so this is the basic difference in the design of the other screws and the malleolar screws these are herbert screws you know which has got uh, smaller diameter threads at the tip and broader diameter thread the diameter of the uh, head which gets engaged into the uh, proximal cortex and this is used for fixing the intraarticular fractures and this can be used for the femur you can use it in the uh, lower end of the humerus especially for capitulum and trochlear fractures when you want to pass through the articular surface and you don't want to have any implant projecting outside you can use this herbert screws then these are mini fragment screws which can be used for the fingers or the metacarpals this also can be used uh, in the uh, facio maxillary surgery and these are different types of plates you can use these screws and plates even for the fixation of the head radius because you need very small screws for that to give you idea about how these screws are small i have kept a k wire by the side so that you know you know how thin it is and uh, these uh, screws need small screw driver small drills everything is this is a small fragment set that you have to keep ready when you are doing these kind of surgeries this is a 4 mm cancellous screw which is used for fixing the acl or pcl bony avulsion fragments and uh, you can use it even for malleolar fixations wherein the uh, wire goes inside guide wire and then you can put a drill on top and then you can pass these cannulated screws and remove the wires then the present day situation is to handle about the lock plates and lock screws and you must know everything about the lock plates and lock screws you know what is the basic difference from the old designs here basically you know the head also has got threads and the plate also has got threads in the plate hole so that this gets locked so this is basically this was primarily invented for osteoporotic bones to prevent the cut out and uh, the tracking out of the screws from the porotic bones but nowadays even for young bones people have started using it uh, right and left so somebody may ask you what is the real indication and then you must know that this was basically designed for the porotic bones and then you must know to prevent cold welding especially in titanium implants you must use a torque limiting screw driver so that you don't excessively tighten the screw head into the slot and you don't land up with a situation of what is called as a cold welding wherein the threads get completely locked into the plate hole and it becomes impossible to remove the screw you have to destroy the head and then only you can take out the screw so torque limiting screw driver is one thing which you must know about then these are the uh, locking cancellous screws the previous ones which i have shown is a locking cortical screw and these are the cancellous screws but with locking head this is a locking cortical screw the thread pitch is much bigger in the cancellous screws whereas it is very thin it is 20 tpi in the cortical screws then these are the various types of screw drivers again these instruments are all museum instrument this was called as a williams screw driver and this could hold the screw into this by adjusting this particular lever and it could uh, work as a self retaining screw driver now we have got these hexagonal screw drivers with these sleeves which do the same job but this was much firmer than these this can sometimes give up uh, from the screw head this never used to give give up so these are the different types of screw drivers that you have to know then let's go to the plates this is a one third tubular plate commonly used for fixation of the fibula because this is a malleable plate this can take the shape of the fibula lower end this also can be used for the uh, fixation of ulna if uh, the uh, bone is not too strong and you can use it uh, in the both locking and non locking designs 
the locking designs, though the plate is thin, do have one or two threads so that the screw head can get locked inside. Then this is an Eggers plate, which has got a long slot, and you had a facility of putting the screw uh, through the hole uh, in a variable position, so that uh, you know even if the slot comes on a fracture side, you can put the screw in uh, the area of your choice. Not very commonly used now. These are Sherman plates, again, museum implant, not very commonly used now. This was used for radius and lap fixation. The improved version of this Sherman plate is now these recon plates, which are available in two uh, thicknesses. And you can get pre-bent plates for pelvis tabular surgery, which are a little more thicker. But otherwise, basically, these recon plates are malleable plates, and you should be able to change the shape of the plate according to the shape of the bone and fix it. So this is one of the indications where you can use this uh, recon plates, the uh, pelvis tabular surgery. Then this is a Mueller's compression device. And uh, you must know, though it is not very commonly used now, somebody may ask because uh, Dr. Mueller was one of the founders of the AO Foundation and uh, has uh, contributed a lot to the trauma surgery. So this particular hook has to engage into the uh, plate slot in the hole, last hole, and this becomes horizontal and you can put a screw through this and then you can tighten it so that you can achieve compression on the table before you put the other screws. And now because of the change design of the plate, this is a dynamic compression plate, the design of the hole has changed to a dynamic hole because of which the use of the Muller's compression device has become very, very rare. This is a staggered hole plate. And if you see, these narrow plates are with all holes in one line. This is used for the uh, radius anna. You can use it for humerus. But if you have to put it on a broader bone to get a better purchase, you know, you have this staggered hole design you know, so that the screws go in different planes on the bone and they can have a better purchase on the bone, especially like TB and femur, which are broad bones. So this is a staggered hole design. Then if you are given a DCP, you may be asked about the principle of a DCP. And you must know that because of this hole, which has got a slope, if you put a screw here and you go on tightening, then as the screw head goes inside, if you have put a screw on the opposite side of the fragment and the fracture fragment, this will pull the plate away from the fracture site, thereby achieving the compression on the fracture area. So this achieves what is called as a dynamic compression. That is why the name of the plate has become DCP, dynamic compression plate. And then further change in the design is the LCDCP. So in the LCDCP, you know, the inferior surface has got these cutouts because of which the contact of this plate onto the bone and periosteum is minimized, thereby avoiding the necrosis of the periosteum and maintaining the vascularity of the bone better. So this is a LCDCP or low contact DCP. Then this is a hook plate for olecranon. You can use this for fixing the olecranons as I have shown in this particular X-ray. Then this is a buttress plate for the proximal tibia. This has got uh, combi holes or uh, this is a dynamic uh, hole design, but you can get it in the locking design also. Then this is a buttress plate for the medial or the posteromedial part of the tibia. When you have a posteromedial fragment, then this is the buttress plate for the distal femur which can fit onto the condyle and then on the shaft. These are the buttress plates for the distal radius. Also, they were called as Ellis plates. So again, if somebody asks you the name, and you can have this oblique design, you can have this T-shaped design. And 
if you are asked why this one hole is elongated then you must know that you can pass first screw on this and then after seeing under the image if you feel that you have to go a little proximally or distally on the bone then you can just loosen this screw and you can have the facility of moving this plate either distally or proximally that is why this one hole is elongated this was again a different design of buttress plate which was used for the proximal humerus or a flatter design was used for even the lower end of the tibia near the malleolus these are t and l variety of buttress plates which were non locking plates used for the proximal tibia then this is a eight plate again for growth modulation i mentioned about those uh, uh, staples which were used before that uh, one of the limb of a staple used to go on either side of the uh, facial line so here these two screws go on either side of the facies and with a very small incision you can put these two screws and Uh, you can stop temporarily the growth on that particular side so in a case of genu valgum you can put it on the medial side of the femur and you can expect correction by only getting the growth on the lateral side of the facies so that the valgus deformity is corrected and then you can remove this and the epiphysis will start i mean the facies will start growing again that is why it is called as a growth modulation rather than uh, the facial fusion you know then these are anatomical locking plates for clavicle this is a plate which is used for the lateral end this is for the central part of the clavicle these are anatomical plates so they take the shape of the uh, bone this is for the lateral side there was a comminuted fracture and we have used this plate for that then this is a philos or proximal humerus uh, locking plate and uh, this is also called as proximal humeral internal locking system so you have multi directional holes to take purchase into different directions into the uh, head and then these are the holes to take to purchase on the shaft so this has uh, actually changed the management of the proximal humerus fractures drastically in the last couple of years so this can be one of the in implants which can be asked on the instrument table then this is a anatomical locking plate or extra articular locking plate for the distal end of the humerus wherein this part sits on to the lateral column and then this goes on the shaft so that you can fix a little distal type of a fracture without encroaching onto the olecranon on fossa you can have a good purchase of four or five screws on the distal fragment and you can go on the shaft without uh, losing the contact of the bone and the plate then these are anatomical plates for distal humerus these are the two designs for the lateral column and this is for the medial column and this is how you can use it if you are asked about it either on the x ray or in the uh, instrument table you must know that when you are using these two plates they should be never of the same length which can reduce the stress riser if both the plates are of the same length then you can produce a stress riser because there are two screws coming from either side into the humerus and this can become a stress zone so you must have two plates of a different length so that the stress riser is not created this is another design of plate this is from zimmer this is a 1990 uh, fixation wherein this comes on the medial side and this is on the posterior lateral side so they are the two plates are at right angles to each other for fixing a, a intraarticular fracture of the lower end of the humerus these are anatomical plates for the olecranon and you can see one of the examples how you can get a hold into the coronoid also through the same plate and uh, you can fix the coron coronoid fracture also from uh, the uh, plate itself then these are the zimmer lower end radius plates 
you can see the small plates do not have curve but the larger plates have curve to match with the curvature of the radius and these are again distal radius variable angle locking plates you must know what is variable angle that you can change the direction of the screw depending on uh, if the screw is trying to go into the articular area you can change the direction and put the screw and still it can get locked so these are variable angle plates and screws for the distal radius then these are anatomical plates for the distal femur there are different designs this is a diamond shape end design wherein you can have 6.5 mm screws through this or in imported plates you have 5.5 mm screws through this and 4.5 mm screws from the uh, proximal holes this is another design of the distal femur locking plate where there is a tapering end on the posterior side so that even if you have some hoofaz element for this this also can be fixed through these posterior screws so that you don't have to put too many other implants inside then this is a locking anatomical plate for the medial side of the distal femur this many companies don't manufacture few companies only manufacture but this fits on the medial surface very well and if there is a medial condyle fracture you can use this particular implant for fixing the medial side fractures then somebody may ask you a recent development and that is anatomical locking plate for patella and we have recently used in two cases you know if there is a stilet kind of a fracture then you instead of disturbing the soft tissues too much you just bring them together pass couple of wires to fix those pieces temporarily and then you can put one of these uh, plates these side holes are for <coughs> passing the sutures through the uh, soft tissues and then these are the locking holes so that you can put the locking screws through this and then once you have done the fixation and you have repaired the soft tissues then you can take out the interfrag wires which you have passed and it gives fairly good fixation then this is called as a raft design of the plate raft plate wherein you have either three or four holes proximally and you can go right subcondrally into this so that it creates a raft effect if you have elevated a depressed fracture then it creates a raft support underneath the articular surface so this is an example of that and this particular hole in this gives you a option of passing an oblique screw which goes posterior medially into the medial condyle you know plate like this then this is anatomical locking plate for proximal tibia initially we saw the non locking and now this is a locking plate and this is the use this is anatomical locking plate for the distal tibia and these are the four holes which will have pulled into the cancellous part plus this again cancellous part this screw goes oblique like this and the other screws go in a little oblique fashion parallel to the articular surface and you can get a very good hold even if the lower fragment is pretty small and these screws are all cancellous screws the upper ones are on cortical screws this is another design it is called as anterolateral plate if there is a coronal split into the uh, lower end of the tibia you know this is one of the best designs of the plates because this comes on the anterior surface and the screws go antero posteriorly so that if there is any coronal split that can be fixed very well and you can put this on to the anterolateral surface the plate being anatomical plate fits in very nicely when you are putting it on to this triangular surface of the bone also then uh, these are the locking plates for calcaneum and this is an example you suppose you are asked about calcaneum then you must know the uh, exact uh, time that you will Uh, going to fix a calcaneum the importance of the soft tissue care and then 
you must know about the uh, bowler's angle, angle of gaze, and so that you know if this kind of a plate is used, uh, then the viva may go on the uh, different aspects of that. Then this is a periprosthetic plate. As the joint replacement is becoming more, more and more common, we are now regularly seeing these peri periprosthetic fractures around the uh, uh, hip implants and the knee implants. And there are now special plates designed for periprosthetic fractures, like this one, which is a periprosthetic plate. And you can have these sharp spikes, which take hold onto the cortex. They don't pierce the cortex completely. And you can pass circlage wires or the control cables through these slots so that they take an excellent grip onto this when you have tightened it. So these are periprosthetic plates for femur. Then these are various types of plate benders. This particular plate bender is used for basically pelvic acetabular surgery, wherein you can bend the plate like this. These are the standard plate benders. They are also called as plate bending iron. This is a roller type of a plate bender wherein you can keep the plate inside here and you can press it with this one roller. Then this is a pudu plate for high table osteotomy. And you can see that there is a block of metal and you can get it in different sizes from 6, 8, 10, 12 millimeters of block depending on how much you want to open up the uh, wedge. This goes and fits in into that particular wedge and then you can pass three screws in the proximal and the remaining screws in the distal part so that you get stab stable osteotomy fixation after putting this plate. This is a kind of uh, procedure that you do. <clears throat> then this is synthesis design of uh, plate for HTO and you can actually pass four screws in the proximal fragment and the distal fragment has these four screws and you can open it up, you can put either a corticocancellous graft or these bone substitute wedges which you can put inside and this is a complete set of instruments where there is a lamina spreader like instrument then this is a spreader to see the opening of the osteotomy these are the serially passing osteotomes. This is a depth gauge. So all this is an entire set of open wedge osteotomy set. Then these are angle blood plates, which some surgeons are still fond of using. This is a very strong implant. And this is a single piece implant. This is uh, with an obtuse angle, which can be used for the um, substitute of uh, DHS. And this can be for a DCS substitute. Like this, you can use it. And you need a separate set of instruments. This is an angle guide. This is a chisel for the angle blade plate. And this has got a similar design like the uh, plate. So we have to make a track with this and then the plate goes in. This is again an angle guide for uh, passing the blade and the uh, osteotome. Then this is and the uh, barrel plates for the DHS. You can get it in different angles and different lanes, short, medium, long barrel. These are the different instruments for DHS. You must know that this is an angle guide, this is the outer cortical reamer, this is a triple reamer, and this is the initial drill, this is a tap, and these are the various length screws and the barrels. Somebody may ask you uh, stepwise which drill bits you use. So initial drill is 8 millimeter, then 10 millimeter for the barrel. Then there is a tap of 10 millimeter and the outer cortical reamer is 16 millimeter. So you must know the uh, sizes of the uh, drills and reamers which you are going to use for DHS. Then if the DHS is asked, then you may be asked about the Baumgarten's Gartner's tip apex index. And you must know what is uh, this uh, tip apex index. 
that the uh, distance from the subchondral area to the tip of the screw in both AP and lateral, this is a tip apex distance. The total of this should not be more than 25. If it is more than 25, then the chances of failure are always very high. So this is a graph which shows this importance of a tip apex index or distance, tip apex distance. Then in a DHS, you may be asked, where will you put the DHS screw? And you must remember this figure, which gives you an idea about where is the best bone quality. The best bone quality is in the center of the uh, neck and head, where there is a crossing of the tension and compression trabeculae. And then it is in the inferior part where it is 82 and 78 percent and superiorly and anteriorly it becomes much lesser in the strength. So the ideal screw placement should be either here or in the inferior part. This is what I was talking about the compression and tension trabeculae. So if your screw goes in this area, it will have probably the best purchase in this particular bone. Then if there is a trochanteric uh, fracture, then uh, if there is an outer wall fracture in addition to the intertrochanteric, then you need this TSP type of a plate, trochanteric stabilization plate, which can be fitted on top of this DHS and you can have a hold into the trochanteric fragment. Then this is a 95 degree dynamic condylar screw. Nowadays, again, the use of this implant has become much less. But previously, we used to use it for subtrochanteric fractures, very strong implant. And the uh, lower end femur fractures, where we could use it, even if there is an intra-articular fracture, this could achieve some compression. And you could get a very strong stability to these lower end femur fractures also. Then let us go to the intramedullary nails. You know, for the intramedullary nail, one of the initial instruments that you need for taking entry into the uh, bone is the awl. And the awl can be of a straight shape or it can be curved. Or in some of the designs, this is a cannulated also. So once you have taken entry into the uh, Trochanter, say for example, through this itself you can pass a non bearded guide wire and then you can take it out so that uh, this cannulated alls they save your time for finding out the track that you have created before passing the guide wire. Then these are the reamers which are non flexible or rigid reamers as they are called and they were from eight and a half, nine, nine and a half, ten. 10 and half, 11, up to 12 millimeters, you know, we had dreamers. And when we were using it for femur, it was by retrograde nailing. Nowadays, because of the availability of flexible dreamers, you know, again, these dreamers are very, very rarely used in the trauma practice now. This is a set of flexible dreamers. You have this fixed front cutting dreamers. And then these are side cutting tips which can be put on this. And this is an exchange sleeve. These are different, different heads of the reamers that you need. These are various intramedullary nails, and we'll see one by one. This is a kumshar nail. The history of the intramedullary nailing cannot be complete without uh, the name of kumshar. You know, in the Second World War, Gerhard Kunscher, you know, he found this particular design of the uh, femur nail. It's called as a clover leaf nail. This used to get compressed when it used to go through the marrow cavity and used to give three-point uh, fixation. So this was the beginning of the intramedullary nailing. And you must know about Gerhard Kunscher and, you know, his contribution with this clover leaf nail. This was used for femur. This did not have any femoral curvature. So uh, that was one of the disadvantages of this particular nail. 
then this is again a kunshar's uh, contribution this is a kunshar's vein nail for tibia you know this had a herzog's vein and this was a open nail with uh, eye on the one side and uh, this could be passed from the proximal tibia and you could do a close fixation with this particular nail but nowadays with interlocking nails i think these instruments have gone more into the museum then this is a contribution by the indian orthopedic surgeon dr ak talwalkar from mumbai this is a talwalkar square nail for radius ulna this sharp tip end is a ulna nail and a beveled end is a radius nail which i'll show in the next slide and the principle was a square nail into a round marrow so it used to give rotational stability that was the principle on which dr talwalkar invented the square nails and you can see because the radius nail entries from the side so as to prevent the penetration of the opposite side by a sharp pain he made this beveled edge so that the nail could glide into the marrow and Uh, did not perforate the marrow on, i mean this uh, cortex on the opposite side then nowadays if uh, you get uh, the nail stuck inside many times it becomes a nightmare so again the, the kshirsagar and company they have taken out this beautiful set of square nail removal implant uh, instruments and you can put this instrument on the tip of the nail and you can put this rod with this hammer round hammer and you can take out even difficult situation nails square nails with this in instrument then this is something which is very commonly used in gujarat side this is called as a enders nail you can see these are flexible nails of uh, stainless steel and this has got an eye on the end so you can put these multiple nails into the marrow and uh, you can get a rotational stability as well as the varus vargals uh, stability and this is an extractor which can get engaged into this and you can take it out so this is a slap hammer which is used for taking out the nails the further development of this intramedullary nails was a elastic titanium nail or tens it is called as which is used for mainly pediatric fracture fixations and this comes in different colors depending on the diameter and the specialty is it has got a sharp and curved end at the top tip so that the nail can negotiate very easily through the marrow and you must know the principle that at the fracture site these two nails must be curved in such a way that they go near the fracture site and they touch both the cortices so that you get the excellent uh, stability of the fracture and the tips will go into the cancellous part, part of the uh, trochanteric area and engage there then these are the benders which are needed for the elastic titanium nails and these are as i said different color codes and different diameters then this is a interlocking nail for humerus you can have multiple screw options proximally as well as distally but most of the people use either single hole uh, nail design or maximum two hole design not so many screws inside and for transverse fractures most of the trauma surgeons have stopped using this intramedullary nail because the incidence of delayed and non unions is much more in spiral or spiral or uh, comminuted fractures this nail is still one of the best implants wherein you can do the fixation with minimum exposure of the soft tissues and uh, you can get good union then this is a interlock nail for tibia again you must know the parts this is a herzog bend which allows it from uh, the front side of the tibia to enter inside and give good stability and this is an expert tibia nail which has got options of putting multi direction screws 
into the proximal end as well as distally and there are a screws going in different directions because of which and the herzog's bend also is very minimal and at a pretty higher level because of which this nail can be even used for fixing little proximal type of fractures which you cannot normally fix with interlock nail and even very distal fractures because then you have multiple options of putting screws in different direction like what has been shown here then this is interlock nail for tip uh, femur the difference from the kunshar nail is this has got an anatomic curvature of the uh, femur the anterolateral curvature which is there that is given to this nail and this introduction of the interlocking nails has revolutionized the treatment of these long bone fractures especially the femur and tibia because you can do these fixations with minimum exposure of the soft tissues and uh, with without opening the fractures that you can get excellent rotation stability because of the uh, passing of screws through both the cortices and through the nail so the nail is fixed to the uh, uh, cortex by the help of the screw then for the intertrochanteric fractures the further extension of interlocking nail was a proximal femoral nail there are different designs available and on Uh, the name of design you know the nail nail uh, name also changes uh, but the commonest use uh, name is pfn or proximal femoral nail where there is usually option of passing two screws one is 8 mm and second is 6 mm and uh, if this is asked then somebody may ask you what is the z effect and how you should prevent that z effect by keeping the length of these screws in such a way that this doesn't become longer than this particular level so z effect and uh, toggle effect you know these are the words which are commonly used and you must know about it the a little modification of this is a uh, intertan which is introduced by smith and nephew and here instead of this smaller screw going on top goes underneath and as you tighten this actually it pulls this screw back when the thread is get engaged and it can achieve a calculated compression of 5 or 10 mm when you are doing fixation of the it fractures so this is a intertan then this is a pfn a2 which is a patented design of synthes wherein there is a spiral blade which has to be hammered into the osteoporotic bone and it uh, compresses the bone when it is advanced doesn't you know instead of uh, you know splintering the cortex you know it takes hold on to the bone by compression and gives good stability in a porotic bone so this is a pfn a2 then in the distal fractures you can have similarly distal femoral nail or supracondylar nail as it is called and you can have multiple screws passing through this area and then going up uh, the practical difficulties you must know that for doing locking of this number 1 it's a free hand locking and because of the position of the patient it becomes difficult to visualize the whole and sometimes uh, you have to struggle to do the locking then uh, this is a common removal set for various companies intermediary nails you know these are different different conical bolts of different threading and there is a name of different company on that so you can keep the same extractor and after keeping the Uh, same extractor you can change the uh, uh, threaded uh, conical tips to engage into the threads of the nail and you can remove the nail uh, with this one single instrument 
then in case the, the nail is broken then like broken screw removal you must have a set for broken nail removal and you can see that uh, this goes inside and tries to engage into the marrow of uh, the nail and once it has cut threads into it then you can take it out quite easily then the last part is implants i mean this prosthetic uh, implants and instruments this is for hemiarthroplasty of the hip you know uh, this is a box uh, osteotome this is a cork screw this is a gauge for measuring the size of the head of the femur this is a murphy skid which is used for reducing the uh, head into the acetabulum when you are using the prosthesis this is a pusher cum teflon uh, tip impactor and these are the ras and these are the chandler's clamp and these two uh, blades uh, to do the distraction and this is a self retaining retractor it saves one assistant when you are doing the surgery this is a chandler retractor i have purposely shown it as a big this thing you have to put this on to this and this will go on to this part so you you can have uh, this uh, chandler's retractor which will uh, save one uh, assistant job when you are doing the hip surgery this is a murphy skid to reduce the uh, femoral processes or even the head this is a cork screw head remover and these are austin moor processes you must know that uh, this was a single unit processes and they had these holes in the stem through which it was claimed that the bone will grow and it will give a stability nowadays uh, i think most of us have stopped using these austin moors and thompson's processes thompson's processes were similar but with a longer neck and there were no holes in the stem so could be used as a cemented one in the past but nowadays i said most of the people have stopped using this austin moor and thompson's processes this is a thompson processes and as you can see there are no holes into the stem and you can see this was used with cement then came the era of the non modular bipolar processes it was claimed that this part moves in the bony acetabulum and the head moves into the acetabulum which is put uh, with a plastic liner inside this cup so one plane of movement here and one plane of movement here that was the reason why it was called as a bipolar processes and this is modular because you can change the neck length and the uh, head size of Uh, this particular processes then this is the near shoulder processes again one of the crudest design of a shoulder processes very little adjustment available of the neck length and the shaft and nowadays again has become a museum piece not many people use it now this is a modular shoulder processes wherein you can change the depth of this and adjust the neck length plus this also has become separate this is a socket or glenoid and you can see that uh, we can get a position like this hmm. then this is a total hip replacement uh, implant this can be useful to you not only on the instrument table but as a vascular necrosis of the femoral head can be one of the long cases you know if you go up to the treatment part and discussion then what kind of implants you will use and then depending on the age of the patient what particular material has got the minimal coefficient of friction that all will come into the discussion and you must know that the ceramic on ceramic has got the lowest coefficient of friction so has got the highest longevity and it can last for about 30 35 years if you use both the liner as well as the head of ceramic material so 
this is about the hip replacement processes and then you must know that you can have cemented and uncemented if it is uncemented then you must have a coating on this either the proximal part which fits into the trochanter or in many of them they have a full coating and then this is a total knee replacement processes you must know what are the components this is a femoral component this is a tbl tray and this is a polyethylene liner then you must know about uh, what is a cruciate retaining and cruciate sacrificing total knee uh, design so that is the minimum that uh, is expected to be known then this is a radial head processes again these were the non modular ones when it came nowadays we have got uh, modular designs wherein you can change the length you can change the size and you can fit it into the uh, medullary canal nicely so i think this completes a very exhaustive list of uh, different orthopedic instruments and implants i have gone little fast but then i have tried to cover up, uh, at least those important instruments which can invite some discussion and questions on the practical table if uh, students have any questions don't hesitate because now uh, you won't be able to have another instrument class before the exams so any questions you can ask on the question box or you can even unmute yourself and you can ask the question marathon class <laughs> yeah <laughs> last time we had divided it into two yeah. Yes, but sir. then now there is no time for a second <laughs> class so i thought i'll cover it up in one class itself you know yes sir congratulations kakat ka sir i think you have taken the whole thing basically it cannot be covered in one class but uh, you have basically taken the whole I, i think those who have listened to your class i think uh, they can answer most of the 99.9 questions part of questions you have already been discussed in this issues if there is any particular question from any of the student we can take for for i think already is 925 yeah sir we can five, answer sir 510 uh, many i think kakat sir can kakat sir, sir uh, uh, stop sharing sir stop sharing sir okay okay because i think kakat sir at a stretch kakat sir has told like one and half hour i think he must be rested for 10 minutes if no, we can no, answer no, the I... question we will be happy no problem no and uh, in addition to the students you know uh, the uh, examiners who are going on the uh, dnb exam you know if you have any particular questions on these uh, implants and instruments that you are uh, normally fond of asking i think you can also put those questions so that the students can get that benefit you know samanta sir and then jain Uday sir, Kumar. my all questions are covered. <laughs> Your questions are covered. <laughs> sir, all the all the implants and instruments are covered, sir. Nothing left, sir. Okay, okay. <laughs> Now they Maybe, have to do the theory part, basically. But sometimes they are theory part, the working length and other things, so then how they play it, how yeah. many screws for each fracture, for uh, that that has to they read, sir. They have to read. Yeah, they have to read. Like that they have to for read. a locking plate, you know, if you are uh, using, then the density of the screws, they must know that you should not lock all the screws. you must have alternate screws so as to maintain the elasticity so all that theoretical part i think uh, yes yes sir. they is, must know yeah that is i, I think uh, in the in the i think in the instrument or the this implant table you have to identify the in, implant and instrument then probably the most of the part is theoretical yeah. and i think kakatkar sir what he has told the basic whatever basic theory will be the starting point i think Uh, you are you are unmuted Samantha, sir you are muted sir uh, sir samanta sir samanta sir ah, you okay. are muted ah, ha yeah. Ah, yeah no 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 i i am i am i am there i am there i am not muted no you, the ah. uh, comment that you are making you know in between you got muted so we couldn't listen no no uh, one phone call was coming that that, that thing okay. i th- i think i think i think uh, the big if you identify the instrument then most of the questions will be usually towards the theoretical aspect that so true. that part that part you have to understand you should you cannot make mistake on the your locking uh, compressor screws how it works 
what is the unit of the dcp everything he has told beautifully yeah. one no more the good thing was you have shown sir all the instruments uh, used for a particular surgery yeah. like uh, few of the examiners say pick up those instruments that you are going to use for dhs okay so now that you have a slide if they have kept it in mind they'll at least pick up all the uh, correct instruments yeah Yeah. So even, they, even if you, I think in the chat even box, even twenty one even suppose even the even, the, even the instrument or the implant of the DHS some I have seen the examiner there you ask you how to reduce the trochanteric fracture so basically these are all very theoretical you must know that these part are all theory these cannot be taught in one class. That's true. theory we cannot cover in uh, one class. That is know? that no no that is that cannot be covered. If there is any particular question from any of the uh, students, we are happy to answer. What are the advantages and indication of proximally HA coated stem compared to fully coated? THR so basic THR THR okay okay. So basically the. Now nowadays the people that are making the proximally coated stems. These are more favorable because because you see the fitting in the proximal part. There is the that is the most important part in the implant design. If you just make it fully coated, I think it is uh, is now it is going out of the market because the metaphyseal fit is the most important. So the stress distribution wise, the proximally coated. Uh, uh, uncemented THS are now in the market. Uh, there is one question: Can Herbert screws be mentioned as headless screws? Yes, you can. Yes, can. Yes, you can mention it as a headless screw. So that Rajesh right. Kumar sir has managed few questions which were asked by students. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> so I answer that, sir. I have answer yeah, because. Uh, Sir will be tired by the time. Ah, that, that's that's a two say time. Two say two say. Because because I have also answered few questions in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that. And But usually, by the way, this question, the student who asked this question of totally coated and proximally coated, you will be asked the formula of hydroxyapatite. Not all these questions when you are on the uh, table, instrument table. You will be asked what is the advantage of HA. And yeah. this viva goes if you are going for a gold medal. That's true. And usually we will ask the identify the instrument, sir. Next parts of the instrument, and then indications. Yeah. Next complications. That's how the four sir four questions we will ask the students. Usually whether it be UGE or PG. Sometimes fancy questions like uh, how we are doing arthroplasty suddenly that uh, that the head is dropped down and how do you measure it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask the <laughs> students. <laughs> Then I have to drop the gaze also down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this question always, uh, whenever I do arthroplasty, I will ask the uh, students. Uh, suppose suddenly the head is dropped, then how do you measure it? Then they will just they break their head to how how can you measure? It? <laughs> Then I'll ask also ask some of time the fancy question. How do you measure if you don't find the gaze? Gaze on the table. Then you have to see the press fit, the trial fit. Uh, that's the uh, that's the one of the things. Of, uh, uh, suction radius. effect, suction which effect. comes easily, yeah. should not uh, use it. That you when you when you are using, you have to shoot the shoulder. Then that is the one you have to use. Mm -hmm. So we are lifting with only uh, elbow. You should not use that uh, process. When you want to take the shoulder also, that's what we tell the students. Sir. Yeah, <laughs> these are two fancy things. Sir. You just ask in the examination. <laughs> Before ending this session, I want to uh, volunteers to present the case on Saturday. Those who are ready, make uh, please put it in the group. I think I think Jayant, one of my student, uh, Dr. Rivudi, he is he will be presenting one case on. Uh, uh, I think he is presenting one thing on. I think radial nerve palsy or whatever. Okay. One case is ready with me. One, I have a case. I have sent it to someone. One of the students. It is of a non-union, infected non-union of humerus. That student is not coming forward. Another one was sent to case of rickets. He is also not coming forward. And you, know, you sir, Jain sir, Sharma sir, Jain sir. Yes, sir. You just forward the same to Shivan and sir. We will find one PG from our side. Okay. Okay.
we'll find from one one pg from our side sir because all exam going students i think they should make full use of uh, this opportunity to present so that you know you uh, face all the questions on these kind of uh, cases and you can be very well prepared you know because in these uh, classes none of the questions will be un unanswered you know? whatever is asked uh, answer will be given from uh, the uh, uh, teachers for every question so you can get a ready made material you know so i think you should come ahead and present cases so that uh, you get maximum benefit and today also all the exam going pg sir logged in sir because the the, the number was up to 90 above 90 sir today okay so after this main uh, class is over most of them left but it was 90 sir all my all our pgs joined sir all our exam going pgs in fact well, they gathered they gathered in one room and watched it. this one okay okay <laughs> gorav you were sent this case from me gorav hardavat yes sir yeah you were sent this case of rickets yes sir i have messaged it yes sir so you will be presenting it on saturday Your exam yes, going Dinanath. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you present uh, that case. Sir, actually one problem is there, sir. What? Uh, I am not. Pardon? Gauro. His voice is not coming. I think Samantha sir's patient's uh, student's case is ready. He can present next. No, we'll we'll need two sir short cases. No, we need, sir, we need two cases. No, we we need two cases for discussion for one hour because both the cases will be short cases, no? Huh. Yes. So okay, Gaurav is holding. He'll send it to somebody. Jain Sharma sir. Ah, Gaurav. Yes. Sir, uh, this is Jain Sharma. Another one thing, Jain Jain, if you are directly in position that there is a second case somebody is not doing, I am also one. Knee stiffness case is with me. If at the last moment it is not there, I will be sir, preparing somebody. Okay, sir. So we have two cases for Saturday. We'll meet at around five uh, thirty or six, whatever time you say, sir. No, no, at six six five thirty. I think most of the faculty is there, but the students are not ready. Okay, six o'clock. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, six. okay. Let's end the session. Good night, sir. Okay. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Gagarka, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye.